There's a common expression that's called like the stick and the carrot. Also kind of like a, uh, oh, how do they say it? It's basically a fallacy. It's an idea of where you make certain statements in order to prove your point. You invent some statistic like saying many people. Well, you don't know how many people or you say most of something and you don't know how many there were. You just use vague statements in order to cover some kind of point you're trying to make. Usually this is done in a negative way. Now, if it was done in a positive way, I might agree with it somewhat. But most of the time when you hear a Christian pastor or somebody talking about some Christian topic, you'll often hear them use those terms in vague ways to cover the fact that they did not do any research. God, has said, God said it this way, man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. Jesus never allowed his disciples to go out and criticize John the Baptist, although they tried. They went out and they said, look, you're not doing it the right way. We're with Jesus and you're supposed to do it our way. And Jesus said, no, don't forbid them to do it, let them. As a matter of fact, no man can receive what he has except it was given to him from my Father in heaven. That's an interesting perspective because in America today, we have lots of people running around telling everyone how to do something. You know, it's kind of fun to watch, you know, a bunch of men gathered together, you know, because men are typical of working cooperatively, forming a committee, standing together one and shoulder to shoulder and working, you know, side by side to accomplish a goal and a purpose. Not. You get a bunch of men together and you see like there's this kind of like what used to be called, you know, urination contest, you know, and kind of like the top dog, you know, and there's always this somebody's got to assert themselves to be the quote unquote leader. And Jesus said the opposite. He said, look, you Gentiles want to exercise leadership over one another, but don't be like they are. Be my children. Be servants of the Most High God and don't be in charge. Be the servant of all. So, when you get a bunch of men together, you always have a bunch of experts. And it's always kind of fun to watch because you'll see, you know, whether it's working on a car, whether it's a football team, whether it's a sports event, a political talk, or any other occasion. When you get a bunch of men together, unfortunately, they don't know how to work together. Now, women do the same thing in some other ways, and there's kind of like this, you know, like you'll see in some kind of show or whatever, cat fights or, you know, women territorial. But men like to one-upmanship. There's a certain amount of domination and recessiveness. But there's also sometimes some of the old-timers that are a little wiser, a little smarter, a little more attuned to human nature. And they'll kind of let someone do their thing. I've done it a lot, you know, when I've got into a situation and circumstance where I know the answer. But I know darn well that if I told the truth, the person would not be able to receive it because they weren't ready. So I just help them to do their stupid thing and let them suffer the consequences of their action until they're ready to hear a better way. And I'll just say, look, we can keep doing it this way, or what do you think about this? And I'll ask them their opinion as I present my perspective. And they usually will respond in a positive way because I've already seen what dumb thing they're doing. That's kind of what happens when people use this whole idea of tearing down in order to make some kind of platform for them to stand on. And that's real shaky ground. The perspective is don't let your left hand tear down what your right hand is building. If you have something to say that's going to build someone up, then build them up. If you have something that's going to tear them down, then tear them down. McDonald's used to have the number one management training program in the nation. As a matter of fact, back in the, I believe, 70s and 80s, it was considered by Forbes as the most prolific, positive, management training program in the world because it taught a perspective about how to train and supervise employees. And one of the things was like, you know, not giving a backhanded compliment, meaning like you say, you did a good job, but, or this is good, however, this is a better way. You know, it, it, that's all, those aren't real compliments. When you compliment someone, you take the time to only state that compliment. You say, hey, that was a good job. You did good. And you walk away and let the person enjoy the compliment. 
You don't sit there and critique someone and say, well, this could have been like this and this could have been like this, but you did a good job. No. You see, there's a time and a place for everything under the sun. A time to be born, a time to die, a time for critique, a time for compliments, a time for rising up, a time for sitting down, a time for tearing down, a time for building up. But when you're giving a message of God, don't let your right hand you know, build something that your left hand's going to tear apart and tear each other up. It's just gnashing of teeth and it's just wasting everyone's time. Because on the right hand, you know, you may get their ear when you're appealing to their negative emotions, like most people will say, well, the church does this and they're so bad and the Christians abuse this and then you being a Christian, of course, aren't talking about yourself, which you should be. But, you know, then you say, but we have this and we do this. Well, what difference does it make to someone who's listening? They look at you as a hypocrite. Don't condemn something else when you yourself are part of that something else, whether you know it or not. That's the point of not letting your left hand tear down what your right hand is building. Because on the one hand, you were meant to be open-faced before God. All are sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so you don't have to tell anybody that they're a sinner. They know it. They know they're screwed up. They know what the church looks like. They know what the world looks like. They know what one church compared to another church looks like. They know all that. The point is, what do they know that's good news that you're supposed to be sharing? I mean, if you don't have any good news, shut up. I mean, to be honest, on the one hand, there's a certain amount of Bible teaching. Yeah, you'll get to some perspectives where you can really, you know, talk a little bit about what's wrong, but you're supposed to offer a solution about what is right. In other words, don't always be the magpie of what's wrong with the world, but rather be the voice of God with what is right. Because God is pointing us in a direction that has nothing to do with tearing someone down, but has everything to do with building someone up and leading them to the place where they can enjoy and know the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Today, looking at utmost, because that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to accomplish our utmost for His highest, we often find ourselves questioning and asking, am I my brother's keeper? None of us lives to himself, Romans 14, 7. Has it ever dawned on you that you are responsible spiritually to God for other people? Think about that. You know, don't let that one slide by and just go, okay, get to the point. That is the point. Have you ever dawned on you that you personally are responsible spiritually to God for other people? The people around you. You are the one that's causing them to be excitable, peaceable, violent, nonviolent. You're the one. You are the salt of the earth. If you're the salt of the earth and you're not influencing people around you, you're just being stomped on by world. You're just being stomped on by men. You're just being stomped on by your good ideas of getting involved in political issues, you know, and trying to manipulate things to be a Christian version of it. I'm sorry, there is no Christian version of politics. God is in control. That's it, period. Done, over, said, we'll get on with it. Do what God wants you to do. Don't be so physically minded, you're no spiritual good. For instance, if I allow any turning away from God in my private life, meaning those things that God is telling me to change in my life, everyone around me suffers. The husband who's watching pornography inside of a Christian home is influencing, whether they see him doing it or not, everyone in that home. Matter of fact, he might even be doing it in an apartment complex or some other place. It may be affecting the entire environment. In the 60s, we used to have this expression, good vibes. You know. Now, unfortunately, Scientology got weirded on it you know, and decided to create this false religion where they think that vibes and vibrations and East Occidental, you know, Eastern Oriental kind of Buddhists want to get you into this vibration healing thing where they can take your vibes you know, and kind of demagnetize your body in some way by using magnets and using their hands and doing some kind of you know, healing that they don't realize is real. It's spiritually based and you're being deceived. But the point is, they think of vibes. But the 60s, we used to say, when you walked into a room, you could feel the vibes. You know, you felt like, hey, this, there's anger in here, or you know, it, it's not comfortable here, or it's not peaceful. And you know, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but it's a spiritual truth, not a physical application that, unfortunately, humanism tries to make up some kind of world indoctrination about. 
the spiritual truth is there is a spiritual reason there for what you're sensing and that is the fact that you are influencing that environment or someone else is when you go into a crowd just a crowd of people if you are aware of it you can watch how fast a crowd can turn into a mob and do things they never would have thought of doing because that's what happens when what we call mob mentality which is really a spiritual aspect of a power that we're not giving credit to but mob mentality takes over a crowd and makes it into a mob and they do things they never would have done crucifying Jesus was one of them you know some provokers had gone into the crowd and decided to scream out you know give us Barabbas crucify Jesus you know so they did they started just all screaming it the same thing happens at football games or in some type of world environment where there's a lot of people involved thousands of people and they're all happy about celebrating then some person one person gets this idea of you know like throwing over a car or starting a fire then suddenly the crowd becomes a mob and they all join in you know some people will do it out of personal choice some people do it just because they're influenced by the crowd and that becomes the mob mentality it's a spiritual thing that happens you always as a Christian can resist that you always as a Christian can watch the crowd run away and go become a mob but if you indulge in it you'll be swept up into it and that's the part of why you don't realize maybe all that God means when he says you are the preservative you are the salt you are the light that's what God intends for you to be so when you indulge yourself in sin then everyone around you suffers. We sit together in heavenly places according to Ephesians 2 6. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. 1 Corinthians 12 26. If you allow physical selfishness, mental carelessness, moral insensitivity, or spiritual weakness, everyone in contact with you will suffer. I am constantly being challenged by pastors and ministers and people of God and children of God and women of God and boy, people on social medias that always want to throw out some garbage and call it God. And I ask them, do you realize what that does to a person? You know, let's just throw out some sad, you know, country western song and say, throw a scripture on top of it and say well this is you know a good song for you to think about how misery loves company you know and we should turn to God no you don't go mixing that which is old wine with new lest the wine skins burst you don't go throwing something from the world into something spiritual it doesn't work that way misery or country western some songs that are delving into the soulful experience as well as rock and roll songs and other songs too that want to influence your feelings are going to lead your feelings so when you do that you are leading other people astray when you indulge in your freedom and stumble someone else you're causing them to sin and creating an environment that's not beneficial for anyone else that comes along and it's your sin that did it you think it's your freedom but really God holds you accountable for the spiritual aspect of the person that you've influenced you are your brother's keeper. You are the one who is supposed to be building up, not tearing down another soul and giving to God another spirit that he can work with that he would cause to come to salvation. But you ask, who is sufficient to be able to live up to such a lofty standard? Well, our sufficiency is from God and God alone. 2 Corinthians 3.5 You shall be witnesses to me, Acts 1.8 says. How many of us are willing to spend every bit of our nervous, mental, moral, and spiritual energy for Jesus? Oh, we say we are. We declare that, you know, we'll love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, you know, and we'll love God, you know, like ourselves, you know, but we're selfishly loving ourselves and God selfishly for only our own benefit, not for the benefit of others. We're not willing to lay down our selfishness in order to give to someone else that same love we say we have for God. Because Jesus said, hey, it's good that you, you know, love the Lord your God. I'm glad. That's great. That's one of the things you're supposed to do. I'm glad that you heard you love your neighbors yourself and you probably give away money and you take care of people. But then Jesus said something else. 
sell all you have, come follow me. In a lot of ways, that sell all you have really is the rubber meets the road when it comes to what you really are. Are you willing to follow Jesus to the point of what he says and did with his life as far as caring about others? Because the reality of what we are as Christians to be his witnesses is we must deny ourselves. We must crucify ourselves. We must examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. And we must challenge ourselves constantly to see if we're tearing down what we should be building up. Your left hand and your right hand are not working in coercion with each other. They're working against each other when you're giving negative and positive messages at the same time and trying to manipulate one in order to get your point across. It doesn't work that way. God's word is pure. It comes down from heaven pure and simple and easy to be understood. It's only when man adds all these other things that he thinks other people need to know, that other people need to apply, that other people somehow need to work out, that that pure word of God becomes polluted with all the ideas men have to influence man. Men aren't the experts. God looks on the heart, but man only looks on the outward things. This is what Jesus means when he uses the word witness. But it takes time, so be patient with yourself. Why has God left us on earth? It is simply to be saved and sanctified? No, it is to be at work in service to him to do what he tells you to do. Am I willing to be broken bread and poured out wine for him? Am I willing to suffer loss that he might suffer gain for the kingdom of heaven's sake? Am I willing to give up my Harley, my comfort zone, my favorite cruise line, my favorite cruise ship, my football time, my baseball time, my sports time, my job, my life, my wife, my kids? for the sake of the gospel, or for Jesus himself. Am I willing to be of no value to this age or in this life except for one purpose and one alone, to be used as a man and woman to the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I? It's okay to say no, because then you're honest. But don't say yes unless you're doing it, because I'm one who does. My life and my wife and my family and the way we live right now is, to put bluntly, in poverty. We've given up much in order to do what we do and accomplish in the ministry for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of Vidivo and to accomplish that which Jesus has told us to do in sharing our personal relationship with him, our knowledge of who he is and what he does in our life, and to be that kind of witness to people around us, we've had to suffer the loss of a lot of things. My wife especially much to her chagrin because her family is not saved, the loss of intimate relationship with her grandchildren and even her children because they don't want to hear at this time what she has to say. And unfortunately, God doesn't allow us to be there in that same place with them at this time because they don't want us there. Oh, they want us there as long as we shut up and don't talk about Jesus. As long as we don't say a word or make them feel uncomfortable. But of course, for a Christian, that is the ultimate compromise to say no or yes to someone dictating how you should live. We all, with open face, must stand before God and give account for the life we've lived. And when we do, we'll only be able to stand alone and to answer to Jesus for what we did with our bodies as we were living this life in this flesh. When we say to him, yes, Lord, I want to be your servant. Yes, Lord, I want you to be Lord. Yes, Lord, I want you to rule my life. Yes, Lord, I want you to be in charge. And he'll say, really? Then why didn't you let me? You see, that day Jesus will only ask, did you do what I said to do? And if you haven't, he'll tell you you didn't. Because he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Because that's what iniquity is. It's doing things without God telling you to do them. No matter how spiritual they look, no matter how wonderful they sound, no matter how fantastic it appears, if God didn't tell you to do it, it's not godly. My life of service to God is the way I say thank you to Him. It is for His inexpressible, wonderful salvation that I am giving my life to Him to use as He chooses. Remember, it is quite possible for God to set any of us aside if we refuse to be of service to Him. 
for he has created some vessels of honor and some vessels of wrath. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified, Paul said from 1 Corinthians 9.27. Even after having done the work of God and the will of God, we need to recognize that it is God who still decides our salvation. Don't take everything for granted thinking that you're already there or have arrived. Rather, you were created for his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ for good works to be accomplished by him through you to be a witness to the world. And that's why we seek to use these utmost techniques of reading the word of utmost for his highest, to apply to ourselves, to look at whether our left hand is tearing down what his right hand is doing.